Thanks um, very much, Lee, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me to speak to you today. It's certainly um, an honour and a pleasure to be here. And it's certainly lovely to see some of my um, paediatric patients that are all grown up now um, and doing so well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about paediatric Fabry disease. So as we know, Fabry disease is rare. Um, it's a multi-systemic progressive disorder. It's an X-linked disorder, as we've nicely heard already from um, Dawn, who did a wonderful job of um, teaching us all about um, the genetics of Fabry disease. And we know that it's due to an enzyme that's missing in the lysosomes of the cells. And we're aware that there is evidence of storage of these complex glycosphingolipids from very early on. And we know that there's uh, evidence that there's storage from early fetal life. Patients with Fabry disease do present with a wide spectrum and severity of symptoms, and they usually present in childhood. The most common uh, early symptom is neuropathic pain. This is described by children as being a burning, tingling, prickly sensation um, in the hands and the feet. It may be there chronically, so some children do have pain at some level every day. Some children also experience quite significant pain crises where there's an exacerbation of this burning sensation in the hands and the feet. Sometimes it does radiate up the limbs. And for some children, the pain can be so bad that they may not be able to walk. Sometimes the pain is so bad that they can't bear anything on their hands and their feet. This pain may last a few hours. It may even last a few days. And so it does impact on their well-being and their quality of life. Gastrointestinal symptoms are also very common in children with Fabry disease. Now we know that children in general have a lot of gastrointestinal problems. You know, children are often complaining of sore tummies. But in children with Fabry disease, these are recurrent episodes of either pain, nausea, abdominal bloating, Sometimes there can be an alteration in their bowel action. Some children suffer with constipation. Some children suffer with intermittent episodes of diarrhea or alternating constipation and diarrhea. Some children learn that by eating certain foods, this can exacerbate the diarrhea and so self-select their diet and learn the f about the foods that they can't eat. Often um, people will say that certain fatty foods, deep fried foods can exacerbate the pain. There's some other signs and symptoms that may or may not be present early on in children. The characteristic corneal opacification called cornea verticillata is present in most people with Fabry disease, but it's not easy to see. It requires an optometrist or an eye specialist to look at the eye with a special um, machine called a slit lamp. Angiokeratoma are common in Fabry disease, but not so common in paediatric uh, population. Some children very early on may not even have any angiokeratoma, but they progress as children get older. These are very small red lesions that don't blanch when you press them. They often start around the umbilical region, sometimes around the, the upper um, segment of the lower limbs and the truncal area, but also sometimes around and in the mouth. People with Fabry disease either don't sweat or don't sweat very much, but children don't recognise the fact that they're not sweating, so it's not something that they will report. Sometimes parents may notice that their children don't sweat, but it's something that's often not recognised very early on. So as a result, children and adults, adolescents, suffer with heat intolerance. So it's not uncommon for children very early on to enjoy sporting activities, but as they get older and the disease progresses, they can't participate in sport as much as they used to in the past, particularly when the weather is hot and particularly in Australia in summer. And again, that impacts on their well-being and their quality of life. There may be hearing impairment or recurrent episodes of tinnitus. So in a review of the Fabry outcome 
um, survey. The median age of onset of these symptoms in males was six years, but slightly later, not significantly later, but slightly later in females. The neuropathic pain, that burning sensation or the chronic pain in the hands and the feet was reported in almost two thirds of males by seven years of age, and about 40% of females at a slightly later age. Similarly, with the gastrointestinal symptoms, about a third of males uh, started having these symptoms from five years of age and a slightly later age in females. Angiokeratoma, again, in a smaller proportion at a later age, and hypohydrosis, or reduced sweating, is also very common. We've all heard about the later manifestations of Fabry disease with renal involvement, cardiac involvement, uh, Michael's spoken about the central nervous system involvement, but these are actually quite rare in children. Um, it's very unusual to have any significant renal damage in children. Um, often we may not even see any evidence of um, protein in the urine, but we do know that there is accumulation of the glycosphingolipids in the renal podocytes. It's also very unusual for um, children to have any significant cardiac abnormalities. We may see some slight changes on an ECG with uh, variability in their heart rate, but it's unusual to see any significant um, involvement of the cardiac muscle, and it would be very unusual for a, pa a pediatric patient to have a cardiac arrhythmia. However, there is significantly reduced quality of life for children with Fabry disease, and we do know without treatment, it, eventually there's a reduced life expectancy. I won't do this because Dawn's already told us very nicely about X-linked inheritance. Um, what I'd like to do is just share one story with you. Um, this is a boy who was referred to see me at 10 years of age. He had a two year history of severe pain in his feet that was exacerbated by physical exercise, by fever when he became unwell with intercurrent illnesses, um, but also in cold weather. He was initially diagnosed with lots of different things by various different doctors, including growing pains. It got to a point where he could no longer participate in any sporting activities because this would be enough to exacerbate the pain. It occurred most days, um, especially after school, and he also it had some occasional abdominal pain. As a result, he ended up missing a lot of days from school. When we took a family history, mum had some protein in her urine and grandma was described as having some um, heart problems. He, this boy had no detectable alpha-galactosidase A activity and had a mutation um, found or pathogenic variant in the GLA gene. So he had a biochemical diagnosis of Fabry disease confirmed by genetic uh, testing. So initially in Australia, um, we don't have easy access to enzyme replacement therapy for our paediatric patients. So we start off with some symptomatic treatment. And of course, not every patient automatically needs to go on to enzyme replacement therapy, um, but because it is invasive, it does require coming to hospital once every fortnight. It usually takes out the entire day. And so again, that child will be missing a day from school. So we have to balance um, the risks, the benefits of enzyme replacement therapy. But unfortunately in Australia, there are eligibility criteria with the Life Saving Drugs Program, so it's actually quite difficult getting access to treatment for paediatric patients. So we started with a medication called carbamazepine, which is an anticonvulsant medication, which is effective um, in the treatment of neuropathic pain. And that initially led to some improvement. However, he continued to have significant pain I then referred him to the pain clinic where a trial of an antidepressant medication called amitriptyline was tried, followed by pregabalin. Now again, this may dampen some of the symptoms of Fabry disease, but the underlying disease is still progressing. I was able to prove that this boy had uncontrolled pain despite maximal therapy, and he started enzyme replacement therapy at 11 and a half years of age. He's now 14 years of age. There's been, certainly been a significant improvement in um, his pain, um, particularly the severity of the pain crises. He's more active, he's participating in regular exercise, he's 
quality of life has improved. His cardiac, kid, his heart, his kidneys are all normal. So we've managed to get in with treatment before there's any irreversible damage to those organs. So when it comes to treatment, we do start with some, we try some simple um, measures, some symptomatic treatment for the pain. Um, and that may be uh, measures like avoiding anything that may trigger these painful episodes. Simple analgesics, often they're not that effective, but we do try. And then you move on to other medications, such as some of the anticonvulsant or antidepressant medications. Now, of course, these medications do come with side effects as well. With the gastrointestinal symptoms, sometimes just avoiding the foods that may trigger these symptoms can be enough. Um, sometimes people learn to have small, frequent meals, avoiding any fatty foods that may exacerbate the pain. And again, simple analgesics, usually not very effective, and a medication called loperamide can sometimes help significant episodes of diarrhoea. Then we've got disease-specific therapies that are now um, subsidised by the Australian Government's Life Saving Drugs Program in the form of enzyme replacement therapy and chaperone therapy with megalostat. There's also a number of novel therapies that are becoming um, increasingly available and clinical trials. Megalostat at the moment um, is available for, um, there's again some rules and regulations about it, but it's um, currently not approved for paediatric patients under the age of 16 years. However, um, my site at the Children's Hospital at Westmead is now, um, we've just got ethics approval um, to be the Australian site for a clinical trial in paediatric patients who have an amenable mutation in the GLA gene from the age of 12 years. There's still a little bit of uh, paperwork and bureaucracy to get through before we can actually start the trial. But this will be um, one of a, a, a first trial in paediatric patients um, in Australia. There's also another um, novel therapy um, that we may hear about. Um, uh, substrate reduction therapy that again I'm in discussion with um, the pharmaceutical company about potentially doing a drug trial in that which won't rely on um, a, an amenable mutation. Still early days but we're looking at that also. So it's actually I think it's an exciting time in Fabry disease with um, treatments, new treatments becoming available and we'll be able to tailor those treatments to the individual patient. We do know that once children start enzyme replacement therapy, there is a significant reduction in the severity and the frequency of these painful episodes. It may not completely ameliorate the pain, but it certainly does have a significant effect. We do know from studies that there's a reduced accumulation of the globotriacyl ceramide in not only the capillary cells, but also in the renal podocytes. There's also improvement in the gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, there's certainly an improvement in quality of life. And when you say quality of your life, you think of children who have gone from not being able to participate in sport, a missing school. There is one boy that I looked after who got to a point um, that he couldn't go to school on a, a lot of days up in northern New South Wales because there was inadequate air conditioning in the classrooms. So the family ended up homeschooling him. When he started enzyme replacement therapy, his life turned around. He was able to go back to school, participate in modified sporting activities, particularly water sports, um, and became more social and more engaged with his community. We know that it's safe and it's well tolerated. So when we start enzyme replacement therapy, we need to make sure that it is safe for that particular patient and that there's no adverse uh, effects. We started in a centre of excellence and in the paediatric population in New South Wales, it is at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Once we're confident that the patient has not had any significant effects or side effects from the enzyme replacement therapy, we then look to transfer the care to a hospital closer to home, or sometimes we can either also transfer the care to um, home infusion services. So again, we're significantly improving the quality of life. 
The tricky question at the moment is when exactly to start treatment. At the moment, I personally think we're starting treatment too late and there's a group of us in the room who are working very hard with the government and the Life Saving Drugs Program to make um, it easier for us to access treatment for um, children. So I hope I've summarised um, what paediatric uh, Fabry disease is all about, um, that we do know paediatric patients do suffer with significant symptoms even before diagnosis. They often go through a diagnostic odyssey before a diagnosis is established because some of those early signs and symptoms are really non-specific and a lot of doctors don't really understand the significance of those. There's a lot of work going into trying to educate our paediatricians, our paediatric subspecialist colleagues to raise the awareness of Fabry disease to enable an earlier diagnosis and so that we can effectively treat these patients. Um, we, as I mentioned, early diagnosis, careful monitoring and appropriate intervention are important to prevent further uh, future interventions and complications of the condition. So thanks very much everyone for listening. Thanks. Um, just, just relation actually to a relative of mine. Um, if some, a child has pain in their hands and feet in childhood, does that continue through to adulthood? That's um, a really good question. Often um, the pain actually tends to uh, reduce as people get older. Um, without treatment, it is thought to be due to progressive damage of the nerve cells to a point where they're actually so damaged that they're not functioning enough to cause the pain. So um, certainly they do suffer with significant pain in um, childhood and without treatment, those the pain may eventually just go away. Um, young person I'm thinking of, um, she's now in her mid-teens, um, but according to her father, she no longer has those pains, and that's why I was wondering. Right. And I know she has Fabry. Yeah, so um, I guess in females, it is a little bit different, and it may, may not necessarily mean that those nerve fibres have been damaged and that's why she's not causing pain. It may just be a fluctuation in her symptoms. Thank you very much.